Well, here we go. This lesson is called Apologetics in a Secular Age. And if you aren't familiar with either of those terms, just stick with me. I'm going to be explaining exactly what they mean. Now, the present time has been described as a secular age by a philosopher named Charles Taylor. According to Taylor, over a relatively short period of time, we've shifted from a society where belief in God is unchallenged and indeed unproblematic to one in which it's understood to be just one option among the others, and it's frequently not even the easiest option to embrace. A journalist named Colin Hansen notes a similar shift. He says, faith is now more difficult than unbelief. And then what makes our situation so confusing today isn't just that belief seems to be harder than it used to be, but unbelief isn't automatic either. While there are lots of people who find it difficult to believe in God, there are just as many people who find it really hard to not believe in God. It turns out that when it comes to the question of God's existence, there are many thoughtful, well-intentioned people on both sides of the question. And then somewhere in the middle of all that, there's doubters too. In fact, it could be said that doubt is the distinctive feature of our time. No one is immune to doubts about the existence of God, the meaning of life, and hope for the future. It's tough. We feel like we can be sure of very little, and then we can be certain about even less than that. In our secular age, doubt visits both believers and non-believers alike. Where are all these doubts coming from? Well, part of our doubt can be attributed to the overwhelming amount of information and choices that are available to us. It seems like we have an endless array of options when it comes to anything from restaurants to religions. And as a result, those of us who profess faith, we do so despite being haunted by this inescapable sense of its contestability. After all, we know that we could be wrong. So how, in this secular age, can a person sort through the confusion and start to think clearly about faith? That's a question that's really driving this course, and I think the answer comes from apologetics. Now, the word apologetics can actually be a little bit misleading. It sounds like offering an apology. And in fact, that's actually what the word means. But to apologize for something has taken on a different meaning as time has passed. Today, to apologize for something means to acknowledge wrongdoing. But in the past, to offer an apology meant to provide reasons for believing something or behaving a certain way. Apologetics, then, is simply about giving a reason or reasons for why you believe something, do something, or don't do something. Now, on the one hand, Christian apologetics tries to commend the faith to other people. But on the other hand, it tries to defend the faith against naysayers. But because the scene has shifted so much today, apologetics can't just be reserved for other people. Today, we have to become the object of our own apologetic arguments. That's because our secular age makes us feel adrift. We're cross-pressured and we're fragilized. We sense the angst that comes from an overemphasis on imminence at the expense of transcendence. And therefore, we have to commend and defend the truth of Christian faith to ourselves. Sure, we've got to be involved in talking about these things with other people, but we ourselves have to become the objects of our own apologetic arguments. In the words of Martin Lloyd-Jones, the main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. Because belief is always contested, we have to reconsider the case and renew our commitment over and over again. For some people, apologetics sounds like a head trip, an intellectual detour away from what they see as a pretty emotionally based topic. After all, such a person might say, God isn't interested in making sure we know all the answers to every possible question. And that person would be right, because God's goal is higher than that. God wants us to trust him and love him, not merely know about him or be able to recite stock answers to someone's slippery questions. But what if your intellect and your emotions, your head and your heart, aren't as far apart as some people make them seem? What if emphasizing emotions at the expense of intellect actually creates a false dichotomy, separating what was meant to be held together? What if the primary way to access your heart is through your head? Well, that's exactly what philosophers Peter Kreft and Ronald Ticelli insist happens. They say the head is important precisely because it is a gate to the heart. We can only love what we know. 
Take a second and think about that. We can only love what we know. To illustrate what Kraft and Ticelli mean, I can't do any better than to bring up my own relationship with my wife. When I first met my wife, I was attracted to her, but I didn't love her. I didn't even know her. Then as we dated, I came to know her more, and I discovered that I could trust her. And over time, I fell in love with her and committed my life to her. That's how the process worked. As my knowledge of her and trust in her grew, so did my love for her and my commitment to her. And you might not have ever realized it, but that's exactly how it works in a person's relationship with God. Knowledge about God and thinking about faith aren't ends in themselves. They're actually means to an end. And that means that apologetics is a means to an end. Our knowledge about God is meant to inform our trust and support our commitment to God. That's why it's a false dichotomy to separate the head from the heart. We actually need both. But someone might protest that they've known people at church who know a lot about God, but they don't seem to love God or anybody else very much. That's unfortunate and it can happen, but it doesn't undermine what I'm suggesting. We would agree that knowing about someone isn't the same thing as loving them. You can know a lot about a person and not love them. That is possible. But what I'm suggesting is that you can't love someone that you don't know. To put it simply, you can have knowledge without love, but you can't have love without knowledge. And that's what we'll talk about in the next lesson, which is about believing with both your head and your heart.